Welcome back, everybody. We're here in the office. I'm going to take a look at some of the, the text of Beowulf, which, of course, is important, doing some textual studies. Here's something. I don't know how many people were struck by this. Here we have Beowulf, of course, right? The selection from Beowulf. It's an example of literature that we get from the Anglo-Saxons. And today, we call the Anglo-Saxons pagan. They had their own pantheon of gods, such as Thor and Woden, right? Just like, you know, the Vikings. You're probably familiar with, with some of those. And here's something interesting. We're just getting started in the text, and bang, what do we see here? Well, this is really interesting. Sent by God to that nation, a reference here of the Judeo-Christian God. How did this happen? Because this shouldn't be found in a pagan text. A lot of scholars and readers have some different ideas about this. We have to remember, of course, that the text here we get from the oral tradition. And we already talked about the, the scops, those folks who would go around and sing this text and that tellings and retellings would change as would happen, and somewhere along the line, either a Christian scribe very likely heard Beowulf from a scop. But, of course, in order to sit down and put it into a text, he would have to Christianize it, right? And because of this, very likely we get Beowulf from a Christian monk. So when we talk about, you know, this text of Beowulf, we would refer to the, the written text that has been altered. It has been changed from the Anglo-Saxon hero story that was told for years and years and years in the oral tradition. It's a really interesting fact that we get with Beowulf. Now, with that in mind, there's the concept, the idea of filtering, because the person telling, right, telling the text is going to naturally go through and change different accounts to fit his or her purposes. That you might think of that if you're relating a story, right, that happened to you. You can tell somebody, and then that person would retell it from a different angle, would filter those events, and it would be different. So as we go through and we read the text, we have to kind of realize that we have some contrary streams running through pagan literature altered by the, the Christian scribe. And that's going to leave some thematic conflicts because we have the, the loving God. That certainly conflicts with uh, the pagan view of the, the world being a place governed by fate. And there's really no such free will really doesn't have that much of uh, an impact upon a person's life. So that's one of the thematic conflicts that contemporary readers that we have to deal with today. Pop quiz, did anybody catch this one? Just kidding, it's not really a pop quiz. What is that called, do you remember? Beyond the whale road had to yield to him and begin to pay tribute. What is this? This is an example of what? 
a kenning. What would a whale road be? Well, right, it would be in the ocean or the sea. Remember that these kennings, these are early examples of figurative language that were common within the Anglo-Saxon hero tales and that we still have with us in the text today. So let's kind of get started. We got a little bit of, you know, got a little bit of a start here. Here we go. So we here we have Beowulf coming, landing, right? The, the ship there, great description. They're, they're ready for action. They have their, their mail on, their chain mail. It's an example. This is the, the text of Beowulf, the, the book, right? So they're all decked out. And here we see the words from the, the, cent, the, the century who is there on the seashore, whose job is to watch. He's kind of a lookout. And if anything's going on, he's got to, you know, either run for help or stop, see what's going on. And these are his words. Nor have I seen a mightier man at arms on this earth than the one standing here. Unless I am mistaken, he is truly noble. There is no, this is no mere hanger on in a hero's armor. All right, so what do we see here? This is a description, of course, of Beowulf. He is our hero. With these lines, we're seeing something important. One of the characteristics of the hero is that the hero must look the part. A hero has got to look like a hero, right? This is the, the first time that this century has, has seen Beowulf and just, wow. He just looks at Beowulf and how he's decked out. He can tell with his armor and his armaments. He's like, wow, this is no ordinary person. This is someone special. So heroes, what do they have to do? They have to look the part. Not like me, <laughs> not like me. Got to look the part. Oh, did, did anybody catch this? What's this, guys? It's another what? Kenning, the leader of the troop, unlocked his word hoard. What could a word hoard be? His vocabulary, right? His, in a literal sense, his mouth going through, and now he's going to go in and relate what's going on. Why are they here? Who's here? Now we're jumping forward. Please reference the, the line numbers here so you can keep up in the discussion. Beowulf is now at the Great Hall. Now I mean to be a match for Grendel. Settle the outcome in a single combat. What is this? This is part of Beowulf's quest. Of note, this is not Beowulf's land. This is not Beowulf's problem. Yeah, that's something that a lot of readers overlook. He heard about this problem and he takes it on upon himself. So what does a hero do? A hero does great deeds. In other words, hero actions, heroic behavior. Look at this. I hereby renounce 
sword and the shelter of the broad shield. The heavy war board, hand to hand, is how it will be a life and death fight with the fiend. Beowulf proudly says, I'm going to do what? Hand to hand combat. Why? Why would you do that? Why would you fight this monster Randall who's been terrorizing these people and they've got armor, they've got weapons. Why, why would Beowulf do this? Some people say that this is an example of one of the seven deadly sins. Right? Remember those from the period overview? This is an example of pride. He could fight them with weapons, but this is an example of pride. Other people say, uh, not necessarily that, but it's more so this. Right? So we have different ways to look at the text here. Some people say that's an example of pride. Other people say no. This is an example of hero actions behaving heroically. Other people say, hey, I got something different for you. A hero must live beyond his or her life. A hero must become a legend. And how do you become a legend? You do legendary things. You fight a monster without armor and without weapons. And in the next lecture, we will look more at that fiend, Rendell.